Freedom, as the ability to pursue your desires without restraint, is among the pillars of modern society. Underneath this pillar lies the democratic way of government, as no politician could win an election promising less freedoms. And among many populations today, few stray from the belief that this democratic freedom is desirable for both nations and peoples. But such a view is far from that of the Socrates of Plato's Republic, who offers a scathing critique of the common love of democratic freedom. Plato criticizes democracy for its own faulty version of freedom, which, when coupled with equality, as in the democracy, erodes all values and breeds an anarchic and amoral society, doomed to fall into tyranny. And likewise, Plato criticizes the man whose soul is governed like a democracy, for being ruled by unnecessary desires, with no commitment to the good, or, as all argue, meaning. Plato's critique of democratic freedom may not be the immediate focus of the Republic, but it is of the most relevant analyses offered by Plato to the modern day. Plato's Republic consists of a dialogue between Socrates and primarily two associates, Glaucon and Adamantus. Their topic of discussion is largely justice, what it is, what it looks like, and if it is truly desirable. Plato comes to answer these questions by the ninth of the Republic's ten books, doing so in a rather roundabout fashion, setting out a number of theories along the way, two of which must be understood before his critique of democratic freedom can be examined. The first is a theory that plays out throughout the entirety of the Republic. To find out what justice is, instead of inspecting a just individual, Socrates looks for it on a larger scale, saying, Perhaps then, there is more justice in the larger thing, and it will be easier to learn what it is. So if you're willing, let's first find out what sort of thing justice is in a city, and afterwards look for it in the individual, observing the ways in which the smaller is similar to the larger. Through examining the city, we can learn truths about the man, and vice versa. From there, Socrates works to depict the city of justice, the Callipolis, wherein all things are optimized. Throughout books 2, 3, and the beginning of 4, Socrates establishes the just city's virtues, namely wisdom, courage, and moderation, each corresponding to the city's three classes, the philosophers who rule, the guardians who defend the city, and the producers who generate income. Such is the case for the just city, but what of the corresponding just man? To answer this, Plato offers his psychology of the soul. If the city and the man are to be symmetrical, then the soul cannot continue to be understood as one conglomerate. The simple argument that ensues can be understood as follows. The first premise is that the same thing will not be willing to do or undergo opposites in the same part of itself. As when a person is standing still and waving their hand, certainly there are two things, one still and one moving. Next, it is clear that our soul is often drawn towards opposites. It isn't rare for us to feel a debate within ourselves on, say, whether or not to finish the tray of Oreos. On the one side, you may reason that you're full and don't need the extra calories, but on the other, you desire the taste of more Oreos. Hence, Plato states, it isn't unreasonable for us to claim that they are two and different from one another. We'll call the part of the soul with which it calculates the rational part, and the part with which it lusts, hungers, thirsts, and gets excited by other appetites, the irrational, appetitive part companion of certain indulgences and pleasures. But Plato doesn't believe these two parts to encompass the entirety of the soul, since he adds on a third part, the spirited part by which we get angry. And with this, Plato concludes his psychology of the soul, an inquiry into the symmetry of man and city, with the understanding that there are three parts of the soul, just as there are three classes in the city that held it together, the money-making and the appetite of the auxiliary and the spirited, and the deliberative and the rational, Beyond their division, the relationship of these three parts of the soul is crucial. In the Callipolis, the deliberative was proven to be the most effective leader, with the auxiliaries as guardians and the money makers as producers. The same must be said of the soul. It is the rational part that must rule if one is not to be led into chaos by anger or desire. But the three parts of the soul are in constant competition in a power struggle to rule the human. The part of the soul that wins determines the constitution of a person as the people who rule determine the constitution of the city. And there is no certainty that reason will rule the soul. In fact, it's an extremely difficult thing to do. In the Callipolis, only those who are naturally gifted are even considered. 
From then, they require a rigorous education. And Socrates lists a number of poems and professions that must be forbidden from entering the city in order to prevent the corruption of these individuals. All this is done for the hope that reason will govern the soul of the ruler. And even then, Plato concedes that there is no guarantee that the Callipolis will not decay. Socrates declares, It seems to me that there is one form of virtue and an unlimited number of forms of vice, four of which are worth mentioning. And in line with the theory of the city and the man, it seems likely that there are as many types of soul as there are specific types of political constitution. Thus, Plato examines five forms of constitution and five of souls. The aristocracy of the philosopher had at this point already been depicted, but before Socrates could continue with the other four, those of vice, he got an objection and the discussion of constitutions is put off until book eight. Plato makes a hierarchy of personal and political constitutions utilizing his psychology. Having declared the Callipolis as an aristocracy and the one city of virtue, Plato depicts the cities of vice. The first of the bad cities Socrates describes is a timocracy. It is ruled by people whose souls are themselves ruled by the spirited part of the soul, in which the desire for honor, victories, and good reputation are located. It is the second best city to the Callipolis. The third best city is an oligarchy. It is ruled by people whose souls are ruled by their necessary appetites. The fourth best city is a democracy. It is ruled by people whose souls are ruled by unnecessary appetites. The worst city of all is a tyranny. It is ruled by someone whose soul is ruled by its lawless and unnecessary desires. And with this, the democratic city and soul are understood to be the second worst vice, only beaten in evil by tyranny. All that's left to make sense of is why this is. Democracy during Plato's time was not identical to those of the modern day. While we have democratic republics, wherein we vote on representatives to participate in politics, the democracy of Plato's time was that of direct democracy, wherein all those eligible could go and vote directly on laws, and the people who did the bureaucratic work were chosen at random. This can explain part of Plato's description when he says that the democracy is established following a civil war between oligarchs and the public, and, to quote, I suppose that democracy comes about when the poor are victorious, killing some of their opponents and expelling others, and giving the rest an equal share in ruling under the constitution, and for the most part assigning people to positions of rule by lot. But the different form of democracy need not challenge the relevance of Plato's critique to the modern day, for it is more so the values of the democracy that Plato takes issue with, those that we share today. In the Callipolis, it had been the good, residing in knowledge and reason, that was the pillar of the city. But what are the values of the democracy? Freedom! 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 Open up! You don't have a right! You cannot! You cannot do this to me! Freedom, Plato answers. Surely you'd hear a democratic city say that this is the finest thing it has. So that, as a result, it is the only city worth living in for someone who is by nature free. This is the freedom for citizens to act without restriction, without burdening laws and governance, wherein the people are free to govern their lives in the manner of their choosing, without a specific way of life being enforced by a government. Hence why Plato says of the people in a democracy, First of all, then, aren't they free? And isn't the city full of freedom and freedom of speech? And doesn't everyone in it have the license to do what he wants? And alongside this freedom is democracy's other value, equality. Equality here is most clear in the governing of the democracy. No individual has a greater say than another. On the planned structure of selecting rulers, Plato comments of the democracy, isn't it magnificent the way it trembles all this underfoot by giving no thought to what someone was before he entered public life? and by honoring him, if only he tells them that he wishes the majority well. The democracy, by nature, emphasizes that all eligible citizens have an equal share in the rule. No one person is considered a better leader than any other. And among the classes, it is those with the greatest population that rule, the producers. Through the eyes of Plato, this is an atrocity. Only the naturally gifted and extremely well-educated philosopher is fit to rule and the uneducated public is nearly the furthest to that that a city could get. And where extreme freedom and equality are present, 
Plato believes, anarchy follows close behind, as the two erode all existing social hierarchies in the pursuit of maximal freedom and maximal equality. Thus, the democracy favors freedom and equality at the cost of philosophical inquiry into the good, that which Plato believes is most worth doing, and a similar analysis can be made of the democratic man. As we have seen, the city and soul are equivalently split into three parts, the producers, the guardians, and the rulers in the city, and the appetite of the spirited and the rational in the soul. As the producers rule in the democracy through their sheer numbers, it is the appetite of part of the soul that rules in the democrat, due to the far greater amount of desires that are other than reason and anger or the like. Specifically, it is the unnecessary desires that rule the democratic man, unnecessary desires that are harmful to both the body and to the reason and moderation of the soul. The cause for this is to be seen in democratic freedom. The democratic man has the freedom to live his life in any way he chooses. And where people have this license, it is clear that each of them will arrange his own life in whatever manner pleases him. And in line with equality, every way of life is equally valued. But the lower pleasures, the unnecessary desires are stronger and more immediate. While the philosopher is trained to control his desires, the democratic man becomes controlled by his desires. If all ways of life, all pursuits are seen equally as in the democracy, none will know virtue from vice. Thus, the ability to do as one pleases outweighs the pursuit of freedom. And so he lives, always surrendering rule over himself to whichever desire comes along, as if it were chosen by lot. And when that is satisfied, he surrenders the rule to another, not disdaining any, but satisfying them all equally. Ruled by unnecessary desires, his life is neither rational nor spirited. And for this, it is undesirable. And Plato offers a picture of the democratic man's life, saying, And so he lives on, yielding day by day to the desired hand. Sometimes he drinks heavily while listening to the flute. At other times he drinks only water and is on a diet. Sometimes he goes in for physical training. At other times he's idle and neglects everything. And sometimes he even occupies himself with what he takes to be philosophy. But he often engages in politics, leaping up from his seat and saying and doing whatever comes into his mind. If he happens to admire soldiers, he's carried in that direction. If money makers, in that one. There's neither order nor necessity in his life, but he calls it pleasant, free, blessedly happy, and he follows it for as long as he lives. Plato's dissatisfaction for the democratic man's lack of commitment to the good is clear. The anarchy-like amorality places the democracy one misstep away from tyranny, as extreme freedom can't be expected to lead to anything but a change to extreme slavery, whether for a private individual or for a city. And it is the democratic man who has tasted unnecessary desires that seeks it entirely. Like how legends say that anyone who tastes the one piece of human innards that's chopped up with those of other sacrificial victims must inevitably become a wolf. But the tyrant's supposed freedom is another false form of freedom that Plato criticizes and ultimately states a real tyrant is really a slave. With Plato's thought in front of us, his purpose can be better understood. On the side of vice, democracy, and tyranny, on the side of virtue, the Callipolis. Thus he declares, until philosophers rule as kings in cities and reason as kings in souls, cities and souls will have no rest from evils, Glaucon, nor, I think, will the human race. Plato's critique of democracy from a modern perspective proves interesting. As previously mentioned, the democracy known to Plato is vastly different than the democracy practiced in a nation like the United States. However, the democratic values are not so different, as shown by the Declaration of Independence, wherein it says, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And, while it has not always, or arguably ever, lived up fully to these ideas, equality and freedom have been at the backbone of the American Republic and numerous republics since. So how do modern democratic republics and the modern democratic person weigh up to Plato's critique? We may be inclined to dismiss Plato's critique citing the relative stability of recent democratic governments. They appear to be further than a single misstep from tyranny, and also not steeped in anarchy and amorality. As for our rulers, it appears that the intent behind the representative republic is to form an intelligent aristocracy accountable to the people. Yet, the reality seems far from being safe from Plato's critique on two accounts. The first is that these representatives are chosen by the public, 
And, as Plato's analysis made clear, the education of the ruler, in order to ensure their devotion to reason, was crucial for a successful city. In the case of the choice of ruler being held up to the public, as it is every election, the rule of the nation is nearly entirely in the hands of the education of the voters. Plato's rulers, of which there are few, required rigorous testing and training to be perfected. So we may ask, is the contemporary education system, where, in the U.S., teachers are underpaid and classes overfilled, sufficient for preparing those who choose the rulers of a nation? And this is not even to mention the abundance of misinformation that haunts popular sources. The objection to the public's power is the second account by which modern democracies fail by Plato's standards. This objection states, modern nations are only democracies by name. I don't think we're a democracy. We're not a two-party. We're not a three-party. We're an, it's called oligarchy, O-G-L-I-C-H, oligarchy or something like that. When they are closer to oligarchies in reality, setting the overwhelming influence of money in modern politics. Whether this objection or the previous account are accurate, Plato would be dissatisfied with modern nations. Whether modern nations are ruled by oligarchs or by the public, they are not ruled by philosophers, those who are devoted to the pursuit of the capital G good. So long as we believe the freedom to reject knowledge to be more valuable than knowledge itself, democracy will prove more desirable. But even though we maintain freedom over knowledge, Plato points out genuine issues in our system. Since no government will truly succeed while those who chose the rulers are poorly educated. While the prior commentary on Plato's critique of the democratic city didn't favor Plato's political philosophy, I believe that there is reason for his critique of the democratic man to stand stronger. In the modern democracy, each person is, to a varying extent, free to choose their way of life. And it appears to me that most live their way like how Plato describes the democratic man, with the freedom to do so as we choose, and with our desires on equal playing fields, we choose the purchasing of fine goods, indulgence in tasty foods, or the like. We give the reading of a book the same value as the watching of vine compilations, and thus are drawn to the latter. As Plato says, we might even pick up philosophy or physical training one day, but then drop it the next. And, on the surface, this appears to be pleasant, free, and blessedly happy. But I would contend that by giving up rule to our appetitive soul, we are losing control of our very lives. As Plato had said of the democratic man, and so he lives, always surrendering rule over himself to whichever desire comes along. Plato would criticize this for not pursuing the capital G good, but I believe that a modern commentary would criticize it on different grounds. In the life of the man with no commitment, who is ruled by wants and lives day to day, dragged between desires until his death, where is their meaning? Insofar as there is not a convincing answer, the life of the democratic man must be undesirable and the content of his life reconsidered. But that's all I've got to talk about today. This is by no means an exhaustive exploration of democracy and freedom in Plato's work, but it may serve as a good starting point. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, leave a like and subscribe. As always, if you think I got anything wrong, please let me know down below. And until next time.